Uh, I am thrilled this morning to have my son Andrew and his wife Dominique here today. They came in on Friday. They're having to leave after church today to go back to Georgia. Dominique has to work in this mo- in the morning. I've shared with you our how proud we are of our son and our daughter-in-law, but of our son that recently he graduated the police academy in Georgia and is now a police officer in the city of Roswell, and I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Not only, not only is that occupation not viewed the way it was 20 years ago, but he has the, uh, the desire to help people. He has the desire to be a blessing. He has the desire to be there when they need him. He has already seen things. He's been, I think, two months, about about eight weeks. He's already been on the job about eight weeks, and he shared with us this week that he's already seen things that he'll never forget that are just etched in his mind. And I'm thankful that he has a power within him to stay faithful to the Lord in all of this. In fact, right now, I want him to come and just leave a word of testimony, anything he's got on his heart. Again, very proud of him. I could not be more proud. I proudly tell folks, well, my son is a police officer in Roswell, Georgia. I love your son. God bless you. Thank you. Praise God. It's, uh, it's great to be here again in Durham with you guys. Um, it's always wonderful to come back and see familiar faces, new faces. Uh, it's good to be a part of a growing church. Um, it's always bringing in new people. Um, you know, as Dad said, I've, I've been a police officer for about eight weeks, and I've, I've seen things that I wish I didn't have to see. Um, I've been scary scenes. I've been funny scenes. We've seen a lot of funny things happen. It's part of the job. Um, and I really didn't know what I was going to say when I, get up, when I got up here, to be honest with you. But the one thing that today stands out the most about my newfound career is how many people have no one. Nobody loves them. Nobody cares about them. Nobody calls them. Uh, we have a lady in the city of Roswell that's homeless. Um, she's wheelchair bound, but she has no one to push her wheelchair. So she pushes her own wheelchair up and down Holcomb Ridge Road. And the only time we get calls about her is when businesses want us to come and trespass her for no profit. That's a person who has nobody. We are so fortunate to have each other. Your family outside of here, yes, but we're so fortunate to have a church family that truly cares about us. And you may look around and say, you know, I've got lots of friends outside of Harvest Christian Ministries. I've got lots of family that love me. And for most of us, that's true. But you may be that person for somebody else. That's why it's important that you come here. That's why it's important that you be in this house because you may be that person. You don't know what folks deal with behind closed doors. We do because we see behind closed doors. But people that you think have it all together, they simply don't. And the skeletons in their closet are things that they don't want anyone to know about, but a simple encouraging word from you can make all the difference. So this week, I'd encourage you, just find someone. Find someone who needs to be encouraged and be that person for them. That's how you can show Christ to people this week. So again, it's great to be here. Uh, We love all of you. We're thinking about you, even though we don't see you. And hopefully now we'll get to see you guys a lot more than we used to. That's part of the things I like about this job is I do get, you know, weekends off. So um, hopefully this will not be uh, the only time I get to speak to you guys. Anyway, love you all. Thank you for your prayers. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 15, Ephesians 5, 15. Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Someone say amen to the reading of the word. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Sister Wendy, for jumping in and playing some drums today. Appreciate that so much. Blake and uh, Brittany are away on an anniversary uh, weekend, so he called me and told me, and I said, well, is, is uh, Kenley going to be there? He said, yes. I said, well, no problem. <laughs> you know, no problem. So it's good. to Thank you so much for that, and Amber always does a good job choosing our music. The Apostle Paul wrote that we should be careful 
to how we live. That we should not live as unwise or as reckless or as foolish people. But that we should live as wise or prudent or sensible people. I don't know about you, but I can think of some people that that ship has already sailed. Paul wrote that we should make the most of time. The King James Version reads, and most of us recognize this, that Paul wrote that we should redeem the time wisely. Redeem the time wisely. When you redeem a coupon, then you are redeeming something that has been given to you that you had nothing to do with. This morning I was in Food Lion buying uh, some dog food for Oliver, and at the end of the at the end of the transaction, they, you know, Food Line will spit out all these coupons. Not like CVS. CVS, you get enough stuff to go to the moon. <laughs> but Food Line spit out a coupon, and I looked at it, and it was a good coupon for more dog food. And I thought to myself, well, Oliver's going to continue to eat. <laughs> so. I told uh, Sabrina, who's my friend there, I see her every Sunday morning that she's working. I said, hang on one minute, I've got to go use one of these coupons. So I went back and I bought him more dog food because the coupon was a very good thing. So when we redeem a coupon, we're redeeming something that was given to us that really we didn't do anything to get. Our time is given to us. Our time is given to us, and Paul said in the King James Version, he said to redeem or take advantage or to use that time, use the thing that you have been given wisely. Because we live in times that are evil, so we should not be foolish. And that we should understand what the Lord's will is for our life. Make the most of, redeem, or cash in on your time. Don't waste it. Time. Humanity's ability to mark the passage of time is one of the unique developments that is exclusive to our species as a whole. Sure, the animal kingdom, our dogs and our cats, they they can tell when the day is turning from day to night and vice versa, but... Being able to consciously tell at what rate we cycle between the light and the darkness, as well as the speed at which the months and the seasons change and the years progress, that is something that is distinctly human. When I was in grade school, you know, back when every grade was in one room. (laughs) Not really. Back when I was in grade school, I don't know if it's the way it is now, but one of the first things that they tried to teach us knuckleheads was how to tell time. How to look at a clock and tell time. I read a story about a college student who was proudly showing off his new apartment to his friends, and when they got to the den, one of the friends asked, what is that big brass gong doing on the wall? Why why is it there? Why does it have a hammer with it? Well, the student replied, oh, that, that is a talking clock. His friend was puzzled and asked, how does it work? Watch, the student said, and then he proceeded to give the gong an ear-shattering bang with the hammer. Suddenly, someone screamed from the other side of the wall, knock it off, you jerk, it's 2 (laughs) a.m. So that was a time-telling gong. Time. I heard about a blonde, no, I better not say that. (laughs) I heard about a gray-haired old man who asked someone what time it was, and they told him it was 4.45. Well, the man with a puzzled look on his face replied, you know, that is the weirdest thing. I've been asking that question all day, and each time I get a different answer. (laughs) Time. Time shapes our world. It holds a grip on us that we can never escape from. We can have this nicked, we can have this tucked, 
We can rub cream on us. We can get under this light. We can go through this type of therapy. But try as we might, we cannot slow down the hands of time in our life. If God allows us to, we will all grow old and turn gray. Well, some of us will turn gray. As long as there's a Walmart with hair coloring, some will not. (laughs) Amen right there. But if God allows it, time will eventually take its toll and our relatives and our friends will read a synopsis of our life in an obituary. James wrote in James chapter 4 and verse number 14, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be, for you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. You ever heard the phrase, here today, gone tomorrow? Our lives are just like a visible vapor. It, It is around. It can be seen for a while. It can touch. We can touch it. We can manipulate it for a while. But given enough time, our lives like a vapor will just vanish away. That's why Paul wrote, make the most of your time. Make the most of your time while you still have it. Don't be foolish. And here's the real key. He said, don't be foolish, but rather he said that we need to understand what the Lord's will is for our life. We need to understand what the Lord's will is for our life. Understand. We need to know. We need to comprehend what God's will is for our life. Understanding God's will for our lives and doing the things that we can do To allow God to bring to pass His will in our life is one of the most important things that you can do while you walk on this earth. Real satisfaction, real joy does not come by acquiring all of the things that this world has to offer. Real satisfaction, real joy does not come by chasing every hobby or every entertainment, or every body-enhancing product or service. But real joy, real satisfaction comes when we understand what God's will, what God's purpose is for our life, and not only understand it, but pursue it, but go after it, but walk in it. Amen. Jeremiah 29 and 11 tells us, For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Real well-being, real hope, a real future comes when we connect with the Lord and He will help us to understand and to accept and to pursue His will for our lives. Let me tell you something, we can know God's will. We can know God's will and we, once we are in the will of God, God will help us to do. And He he will help us to be everything that He plans for us to be. Someone say amen. Amen. I believe right now would be a good time to give the Lord a hand like the praise. (laughs) Paul wrote that we should make the most of our time. Now, I'm not going to try to sell you on some high-powered time management idea today. In a way, when you think about it, time management is really a misleading concept. We cannot really manage time. We cannot delay it. We cannot speed it up. We cannot save it, or we cannot lose it. No matter what we do, time keeps moving forward at the same rate. So the challenge is not to manage time, but the challenge is to manage ourselves. To make sure that we're doing all that we can to use the time that we have left on this earth wisely. We must manage ourselves to do the things that God has called us to do. Someone say amen. amen. Praise God. The first thing that a man or a woman woman or a young person is called to do is to be saved. You are called to be saved, to repent of sins, to be baptized, and to receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. 
Acts 17 and 30 reads, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. In Acts chapter 2, 38 and 39, the apostle Peter told those who were there when the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, Peter replied, repent and be baptized each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The very first thing that the Lord has called us to do is to repent and to give our heart and our life to Him. 2 Corinthians 6 and 2, for He says, At an acceptable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. If you have not repented, if you have not given your heart and life to Jesus, then today is the right time time. Today is your day of salvation. Someone say amen. Amen. Praise God. Paul wrote that we should make the most of our time. A Christian, a child of God is going to understand that the life that we live on this earth is not our own, but rather we live a life for Jesus Christ. He is the center of our life. God doesn't accomplish His will around what we are. God accomplishes His will when we surround everything in our life around Him. Why can't God work His will in my life? Are you surrounding your life around Him? I thought God wanted me to do this. Why is it not happening? Are you surrounding your life around Him? Jesus teaching in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33 said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. The first consideration, the very first thought for a child of God in everything we do, in every major decision that we make should be, does this line up with what God is doing in my life? Let me say that again. The very first thought for a child of God in everything we do, in every major decisions that we make should be, does this, what what I'm about to do, line up with what God is doing in my life? Let me tell you something today. God is not going to rubber stamp everything that we do just because we say we are saved. Sometimes we look to God as just a power that will always jump in and get us out of the trouble that we've gotten ourselves in. Oh God, bless me financially. I know I don't give my tithe. I know that I should have... God bought that new house and that new car and that new big screen TV and that new jet ski. I know that I should not eat out every night, but God, I know you love me and you will bless me. God does love us and God does bless us, but hear me now, God is not always going to rubber stamp okay on everything that we do. And God is not always going to come and sweep us out of the trouble that we are in because we did not seek His guidance and His wisdom in the first place. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes God does come and rescue the stupid. He does sometimes. Galatians 6 and 7 reads, But don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. I thank God that His grace is sufficient to keep us and to bring us through anything. God may not totally solve our problems for us, but I tell you what He will do. He will be with us and He will help us and He will help us to get through the storm even if it's of our own making. Someone say amen. Amen. Praise God. Paul wrote that we should make the most 
of our time. A Christian, a child of God is going to understand that the life that we live on this earth is not our own. But rather, we live a life centered around Jesus Christ. Seek God's wisdom. Seek God's guidance. Let him help you make the big decisions. Make the most of your time by making God the center of every aspect of your life. Don't push him out of anything in your life. Don't push him out of the time that you have fun. Let him help you in the time that you're having fun to do the right things to have fun. Right. All right. Don't push him out of the decision to buy that new house or that new car. Don't ask me. I've heard preachers that say, well, why didn't you talk to me about buying that new house? Because it's none of your business. Don't ask me. I'll help you pray. You can say, Pastor, will you help me pray about a situation? Absolutely. Ask God. Let God be your God. Amen. There are a lot of things that I could say today to try and give insight as to how we can better make the most of our time on this earth. But those will keep for a better day. But I would be remiss today if I did not just take a minute and tell you that our time on this earth is limited. Our time on this earth is limited. I'm not going to read it for you today, but in Luke chapter 12, Jesus told us a parable about a rich man whose land was very productive. It was so productive that he was faced with a decision, Brother Mike. And that decision that the rich man made was not to honor God and seek his will, but rather his decision was to build bigger barns and to spend the rest of his life taking it easy, eating and drinking and just enjoying himself. The rich man chose to give God no consideration in the time that he had left on this earth. No repentance, no living for God, no doing God's will, just eating and drinking and enjoying himself. Luke 12 and 20 gives us the end of the story. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Paul wrote, make the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I want to finish up today with a little illustration. I, I, one thing that I hope I've gotten through to you is that we must treasure our time as a valuable commodity. Every day, every day is precious. And, and we must be careful how we use the time of that day. If we want to understand how important one year is, we can ask a student who failed a class. If we want to understand how important one month is, we can ask a mother who gave birth to a premature baby. If we want to understand how important one hour is, we can ask a businessman whose flight was delayed by an hour. If you want to understand how important one minute is, we can ask a man who had a heart attack in a restaurant and a doctor happened to be sitting at the next table and his CPR saved his life. If you want to understand how important one second is, we can ask a person who barely missed a head-on collision with an oncoming car. If you want to understand how important one millisecond is, we can ask an Olympian runner who missed a medal by one-tenth of a second. Time is so valuable. My title screen today has the number 86,400 on it. Anyone been wondering what I was going to do with that? And I want to use that number to end this message today. I want you to imagine that every day that you wake up, you have $86,400 in a special account that has been given to you. And at the end of that day, whatever you have not used, whatever you have not spent in that day, it goes away and goes, about, goes back to zero. Every night you lose whatever part of the balance you failed to use during that day. What would you do? Well, I know what I would do. I would do my very best to use every single dime before the day is gone. In a few months, we'd have a nice church. 
I'd be driving a, ni a nicer car. I'd actually have a second car. No more clothes from Goodwill. I'd be living in a nicer house. I'd have an indoor potty area so our dog Oliver would not have to go outside in the rain. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. You'd do some of those things too. The fact is that every one of us already has an account similar to that, and the name of that account is time. Every morning, it credits us with 86,400 seconds. And every night, it writes off as lost, whatever of that time we failed to use wisely. Our time account carries no balance. From day to day, it allows no overdraft. Each day, it opens a new account for us. Each night, it deletes the remains of the day. If we fail to use the day's time, the loss is ours. Not only that, but Andrew talked about a little bit in his testimony. If God had designed for us to do something that day that would bless somebody else and we didn't do it, not only was it our loss, but it was their loss. If we fail to use the day's time, the loss is ours. There's no going back. There's no drawing against tomorrow. That is why we must make the most of today. We cannot waste our time. Once it's gone, we can never get it back. We must treasure our time, and we must use it wisely while we can. Someone said amen. amen. Let's stand together. Paul wrote, Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 reads, And just as is appointed to people to die once after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. My question is today as we close this service is simply this. Are you pleased with how you're using your time? Are you happy with how you're using your time? Do you believe that God is happy with the way you're using the, your time? Are you using your time in a way that if your appointment for your life to end would, were to happen today, are you ready to meet the Lord? Have you used your time in a way that if God were to call you home today, are you ready to meet Him? Are there things that you want to do differently? From right now forward, do you want to make the most of your time? Do you want to repent? Do you want to seek for and understand and follow God's will for your life? And if that's what you want today, I'm asking you to come and let's repent. Let's come and seek the face of the Lord. Let's come and renew your commitment to God. I ask you this, how will you use your 86,400 seconds tomorrow? Let's all come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.